Okay, in this video, we're going to derive the selection rules for vibrational transitions. But first, we're going to talk about how to picture what a vibration looks like and how that changes when light interacts with a molecule, especially how it then applies to things like global warming and climate change. Okay, so let's think about just matter interacting with light. And we'll go back to this picture of a molecule with a dipole, right? Maybe this is HCl. And so positive here, negative here. And I'm going to imagine putting this between two plates that have voltages on it, right? Where this is plus and this is minus. And so the atoms are pushed in because they have these partial charges. But then I'm gonna take and put a minus and a plus on these plates. And well, now the molecule says, well, I'm a plus, I'm attracted back towards this minus, and I'm a minus, I'm attracted back towards this plus. Okay, so this alternating electric field is exactly what light is, an alternating electric field. And so if this motion that I induce back and forth is the same amplitude and frequency necessary to promote an excitation vibrationally, well, then the light will be absorbed. A photon in the particle picture, a photon will be absorbed by the molecule. But really, it's a coupling of this electric field to the natural electric field that exists in the molecule to generate an electric field with twice the amplitude, same frequency. Okay, so that's a little bit of review from uh, previous videos. Okay, so in this picture, of course, the molecule must have a positive and a negative, a dipole to respond to the field. And indeed, only polar molecules can undergo strictly vibrational transitions from light. Okay, so that's a really important uh, part, so I'm going to repeat it again and write some of it down. Okay, only polar molecules that have this charge separation, only polar molecules undergo strictly vibrational transitions. Now, the exception, not really exception, but the, the verbiage here is important. And of course, the vibrational transitions we've referred to quite often in these lectures is from infrared light. Why? Because that energy of light is what matches typically the spacing between to vibrational energy levels. Delta E is HC over lambda. Lambda has to be IR light wavelengths to match this energy to cause this quantized excitation. Now, I said strictly vibrational transitions because as we've talked about in previous lectures with Jablonski diagrams, there can be different electronic states, right? E1, E2, and vibrational states amongst this and so you could imagine an excited vibrational state of this ground electronic state being promoted to a ground vibrational state of an excited electronic state, right? So you can have different vibrational transitions. This is 0, 1, 2. This is 0, 1, 2. And we're changing a vibration from 2 to 0, but it's accompanying an electronic transition, okay? To undergo strictly vibrational transitions within this given electronic state, the molecule has to have some sort of dipole, right? So non-polar molecules, you know, can change vibrational transitions if it's an accompanying an electronic transition. So it's really about, you know, in strictly vibrational transitions, this electric field of light interacting with a dipole. Now, what complicates the picture for people is that there are different kinds of dipole. And this one drawn here and the one you've experienced your whole life and learned about in physics and chemistry is a permanent dipole, right? The fact that chlorine is so much more electronegative than hydrogen that it hogs the electrons. And there's an unequal sharing there that gives us this charge. So there's two types of dipoles. One is this permanent kind. And this is the one we're familiar with usually. Where there's an unequal sharing or I'll say charge separation regardless of nuclear permission, uh, position, or say regardless of vibrational motion. 
Okay, so if you picture HCl, it's not a static picture, it's vibrating back and forth. Don't know why hydrogen's getting smaller, but there we go, right? So it's this picture where HCl is, well, they're moving close together, they're getting further apart, and it's constantly, you know, oscillating between these two types of structures, okay? But throughout any of that, there's always this charge separation. Chlorine is always minus, hydrogen is always plus. That is the permanent dipole, okay? Dynamic dipole is the other type, and this one is more tricky. But you can think about it as sort of the first derivative of this permanent dipole. Not mathematically, but there's a time variance to the dipole. Okay, the dynamic dipole is as the molecule vibrates, the bond distance changes, right? So as the mo molecule vibrates, bond distance changes and therefore the electron density overlap changes. Okay, so we can still picture this with say HCl, right? It's just, just a bit harder to draw, okay? Now, if hydrogen, maybe I'll, I'll draw this really exaggerated here. Here's hydrogen. And here's chlorine, right? There's different relative charges around each atom, sure. But at this bond distance, which is here to here, we'll call this the bond distance, right? Here is the maybe overlap shown in red of the two maybe orbitals that are important uh, for making up the chemical bond, okay? so when I move these atoms closer together, there's a changing in the amount of this orbital overlap and a changing in the picture of, you know, where the electron density is relative to each nuclei, okay? So it's a changing degree of overlap by changing the bond. And this means different relative charges around each atom, right? So permanent is there's always greater density around chlorine than hydrogen, right? But this dynamic part is that unequal sharing itself is unequal with regard to time because these atoms are moving back and forth. It's dynamic, there is a time dependence here, okay? And so what we'll show and do a lot of math about today is that the permanent dipole determines rotational transitions. And selection rules for rotational spectroscopy are due to the permanent dipole. Whereas the dynamic dipole is what's important for vibrational transitions and vibrational selection rules. Okay, so that's what we'll derive today. So you can think about homonuclear diatomics, not HCl, but something like nitrogen or maybe oxygen okay these have neither permanent dipoles because they want the electrons equally nor dynamic okay and the reason is because as the atoms move closer together there's still a completely equitable even sharing and even preference for the electrons so, you know, in HCl, chlorine always wants it more, but as they move together, maybe chlorine is getting even more electron density around than it does when it's further apart, right? Where N2 and O2, they're sharing it equally, doesn't matter the distance between them, they're always sharing it equally, right? Whereas something like CO2, okay, this you would say has no dipole because the oxygen over here pulls the electron density just like this one does. Okay, so there's no permanent dipole, but it does have a dynamic dipole because one of the types of vibrations here looks like this, 
for CO2. And this will lead to a dynamic dipole. So that's what we want to think about for dynamic and permanent. Okay, homonuclear diatomics don't have either. So these homonuclear diatomics don't undergo strictly vibrational transitions. or strictly rotational transitions. Right, and the vibrational here is IR, and the rotational here is microwave. That's the type of radiation necessary. Okay, so what chemical system in your everyday life is made up of primarily homonuclear diatomics? And the answer is our atmosphere, right? 70% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, right? It's 98% of these two things and some other homonuclear diatomics too, like hydrogen, okay? So our atmosphere is primarily like this. And so let's think about briefly what's happening in our atmosphere. Here's sun putting out sunlight. And here's the earth drawn completely to scale. Here's you, also drawn to scale. And so the sun is constantly bombarding the earth. It's where we get our energy from, right? But most of the light that's coming in, there's a distribution, right? But most of the light that is coming in is UV and visible. Okay, that's certainly uh, primarily the most energy we get from the sun is this UV visible light. Now, the Earth would just keep heating up forever unless we were able to cool ourselves. It turns out Earth does not radiate on its own UV or visible light. Well, not much of it. What it radiates is IR light. And IR light, of course, is longer wavelength. Okay, but this is a very basic picture of our thermal equilibrium as a planet. Obviously, the Earth is rotating, so at night we're not getting that UV vis we're still radiating away IR and we cool down, right? But overall, there's sort of this equilibrium, energy in, energy out. But what happens, right? All this UV is allowed to get through. All this IR is allowed to get out. Why is the IR allowed to get out? Well, because there's nitrogen and oxygen here. And that's not getting in the way of this IR light. Why? Because those things don't absorb IR light. So the IR doesn't really see, doesn't really interact with any of these homonuclear diatomics. And so the energy escapes and we maintain our constant temperature, right? So this is our thermal equilibrium. This is necessary. But what happens if we add non-homonuclear or non-diatomics to the atmosphere? And the most well-known one, of course, is, like we talked about back here, CO2. CO2 has a dynamic dipole. And so if we add CO2 to our atmosphere, well, now it is interacting with this IR light. And it's interacting because it has this dynamic dipole. It doesn't have a permanent one, right? No permanent dipole. That matters for rotational motion. But for vibrational motion in IR, there is a dynamic dipole because the unequal charge distribution has a time dependence here when this is vibrating back and forth and this bond's elongating, right? The charge around carbon is being sloshed around unevenly. And so there is a dynamic dipole. A, that electron density overlap is changing, not symmetrically. So CO2 absorbs IR as we add it to our atmosphere, right? This is you. This is you doing bad stuff and adding CO2 from our atmosphere out of the back of your car or something. It's floating up here into our atmosphere. Now, when the Earth tries to sweat and get rid of this light, right, you're pumping CO2 into the atmosphere from fossil fuel combustion, or maybe you're just procreating and making higher populations, or maybe you're cutting down forests that are supposed to turn CO2 into oxygen, 
all of these things add these IR absorbing molecules to the atmosphere. And now the energy that Earth is trying to radiate away and cool itself down is absorbed and kept in our local environment. Okay, sometime later the CO2 will relax and maybe spit out this IR, but it's not guaranteed that it's going to spit it out to space. Right? Much of the time it's going to re emit it down towards the Earth where it gets reabsorbed. Right? So some of this emitted radiation by CO2 goes back into the Earth. And so the net effect is it's the same energy that's coming in, but there's less energy going out. Okay? And so that's a higher overall temperature overall. The Earth keeps heating up. That's our global warming that's affecting our climate. And now, this is you. Okay, so that's our sort of uh, overall takeaway for uh, global warming and how it relates to these permanent and dynamic dipoles. Now, what we must do is talk about mathematically, how do we predict what is going to, uh, how CO2 or, or some of these other dynamic dipole species are going to absorb the light. Okay, the probability is what we're talking about in quantum mechanics. And what we're going to be concerned with is this term mu x m n. Okay, this is called the transition dipole moment. And so the transition dipole moment from we're going to say state n to state m. The dipole is defined only along the x-axis, so that's the only variable we care about because we're still going to stick to, you know, diatomics or linear triatomics. Okay, so uh, imagine this molecule here. This is my x-direction right here. And there is some equilibrium distance, of course and there's a dipole associated with this, minus, plus. Okay, so this is the term we want to talk about, this transition dipole moment. It's the difference in dipoles between an initial and a final state. Okay, so if you're absorbing a photon and transitioning between vibrational energy levels, well, this dipole moment is describing how the electrons are situated in each of those final and initial states. The transition is only going to happen if the electric field from the light induces that change in charge distribution. Okay, so our overall formula here is going to look like this. This transition dipole moment is going to be, you guessed it, an integral. Wave function, okay, of our final state m, which is a function of x itself and is the complex conjugate we're going to need. We're also going to have our initial state n, which is a function of x. And we're doing this just in the singular coordinate since it's a diatomic or linear triatomic. But in the middle here, this is our dipole moment. Okay. Overall, we're calculating the transition dipole moment, right? The dipole moment itself, okay, mu as a function of x, this is the dipole moment. along x-axis and how it's changing as a function of x. And really what we're going to show here is the equilibrium value it usually has plus x. Okay, so this notation here, the dipole moment mu of x, that's just what we call it, dipole moment, as a function of disturbance from the equilibrium position. Okay, so this is, you know, the disturbance from the equilibrium position. So how is this changing as I move further apart or further together from the equilibrium bond length? And this formula looks like an expectation value, and it is. Okay, now, if this big long formula here, which is my transition dipole moment formula, if it's zero, no transition occurs. 
Okay, so again, to take a step back here, the big picture, what we're calculating here is going to be whether a photon can be absorbed and when a photon is absorbed, right? We're transitioning between some initial state and some final state and the dipole is changing a certain way. If there is no change in the dipole, then the photon can't be absorbed because there's not gonna be any net change in the electric field of the molecule. The light can't be absorbed. There will be no transition, okay? Light is only going to be absorbed if it induces a change in the charge distribution. So if there's no change in the charge distrib distribution, there will be no transition, no light absorbed. Okay, now to simplify this integral, right, we're going to have to actually get a Taylor series involved, okay? And this isn't uh, great, right? The, this dis disturbance from equilibrium is really a time-dependent thing, okay? So this Xe plus X, well, what is X? X is how far away it is from equilibrium, but that itself has a time dependence, okay? So this thing that has a time dependence, we're gonna need a Taylor series. And a Taylor series says the following, F of X at A, is equal to f of a plus f prime of a times x minus a plus f double prime a, yada, 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 okay? These terms are gonna turn out to be negligible for our purposes. They're so small. Okay, so what we're doing here is treating this dipole moment that is a function of time with the Taylor series. Because that time dependence can be quite crazy, we're going to simplify it. And instead, we're going to replace this dipole moment that itself is a function of distance from equilibrium, which has a time dependence to it, right? Sometimes it's further apart, later it's closer together. This distance from equilibrium is always changing. There's a time dependence. All this means is that all of that is going to be... First, I should say, let's set... I can call this equilibrium position whatever I want. I'm going to call x of e zero, all right? Just so things are easier and simplified. It could be two angstroms, it could be five angstroms. It's all about relative motion here. So I'm just gonna set X equal to zero. And so my Taylor approximation says all of this that has a time dependence, right? I'm gonna set this equal to zero. And so this is going to turn into mu of X instead of mu of X of all of this. I'm gonna to get to turn this into the following mu at zero plus the first derivative evaluated at zero times x minus zero. Okay, so we're interested in this mu of x, this dipole moment at the value of the equilibrium and then how it changes from equilibrium. Okay, this here is the permanent dipole. Why? Because it is the dipole that does not have an X dependence. It is what it is. Okay. This over here is the dynamic dipole. Dynamic because it's a function of X. Which itself is a function of time right? The distance from equilibrium has its own time dependence. What all this means is that my formula for this transition dipole is simplified not from this dipole that has a bunch of time dependence and crazy functionality to it, to this.
Okay, so what I've done is I've kept the final state here. I've kept the initial state. This is my permanent dipole, just a number, it is what it is. This is my first derivative of the dipole evaluated at the equilibrium times this distance x I am from the equilibrium. And now I can factor this out and come up with two integrals just by separating due to this plus term here. Two different integrals, okay? And what we're trying to evaluate is when this is not going to be equal to zero. Right, this whole transition dipole moment, the value of all these integrals. Okay, now in basically all the cases we care about, for most temperatures, we are in the ground state. Okay, so this state n that I'm starting in, okay, is the ground state n equals zero. Okay, so a lot of times you'll just see not from state n to state m, but from state 0, the ground state, to m, right? So this is state 0, my wave function, and the ground state, not some arbitrary state n, but the ground state n. And it's a good assumption because most of the time we're at room temperature or some temperature where we're not naturally populating these excited vibrational states. Now, what are the wave functions? Okay. Here, and this is where we're going to take a bit of an approximation, right, in deriving these selection rules, is here the wave functions assume as the harmonic oscillator wave functions. Okay, so the selection rule we're going to derive is not going to be totally accurate because we know the real potential is the Morse potential. We learned that in the last episode, last lecture. We're going to use these simple, simpler functionals to get an idea of what the selection rule should be. Okay. And these then look like these normalization constants, right, times these Hermite polynomials. You can go back and watch the lectures on harmonic oscillator and quantum mechanics solving the Schrodinger equation to learn what each of these things mean, right? But here they are, okay? Now, if I think about these wave functions, I can think about this function and this function. This is just a constant. This is the dipole that is permanent. Okay? This is just a constant. It is just evaluating the first derivative of the dipole at x equals zero. So, I'm interested in knowing when this whole coupling of integrals is not zero. I can make the following argument, okay? I can make the following argument that this first one always goes to zero. Why? Orthogonality. This is just a constant, so you could imagine having it outside. And now the integral is just, well, wave function m, wave function n. This is a general property of quantum mechanics that two eigenfunctions integrated overall space, here are the bounds, negative infinity to infinity or zero to infinity if you're using a different coordinate system. This always goes to zero. It's a general property of eigenfunctions. So it turns out this whole first integral, now that we've separated things, goes to zero. And if we're interested in knowing when this transition dipole is not zero, I'm really evaluating when all of this is not zero. So let's take a closer look at that. When is this wave function or this when does this not equal zero? 
And so we could take the constant out front. Here we go. When does that not equal zero? Well, now we have to make the following argument. Okay. The following argument. Right. And we, we can't we can't sit here and say, you know, uh, this might matter if M was zero, because that wouldn't be an actual transition. We'd be starting and ending in the same vibrational level. And that it's not really what we're after. We're after a vibrational transition here. So when is this integral not zero? Okay. Well, what we can think about is what is the functional form of these? Okay. The functional form of this, well, x, that's an odd function, x to the first. This is my ground state function. Okay. And my ground state function has some constants in it for normalization. It has an Eremite polynomial, which is just a constant. For the ground state and it has this gaussian so this zero term is an even function because a gaussian is an even function now these integrals have this property right that an integral from negative infinity to infinity of an odd function is zero right? Think about x cubed, right? Its symmetry dictates that all of this area completely offsets this area, and it integrates to zero over the whole bounds. So if it's an odd function, it's zero. And so what that means is this is odd, this is even. If this excited state is even, then overall integral is odd, and it's zero, okay? So only the wave functions that are going to some odd state, wave function one, wave function three, wave function five, when we're comparing that to wave function zero, only are these going to be allowed, okay? And allowed in the sense that they're not going to completely go to zero. So a transition should be allowed, but we can use one more fact actually. And the next fact is that for all of these higher order odd functions, they have the following visual property, right? If I'm going to graph this even function overall, it turns out it looks something like, well, we can draw this first one. This even one looks like this. And there's a net non-zero integral. Okay, so this transition would happen. It would be allowed. But it turns out that all of these integrals that are even, have the following scenario, which I'm going to poorly illustrate. The positive, even though it's even, the positive exactly cancels the negative. So even though it's an even function, still all of these will actually still equal zero. Okay, so we've done a little bit of calculus here to reduce it to just odd wave functional states I'm going to. So it looks like the selection rule is going to be, you can have a transition from the ground state to odd excited states, but it turns out actually that the only place that the transition dipole is not zero if I'm starting in the ground state is for m equal one. Okay, and so the selection rule then for these vibrational transitions is that this n, whether it's zero as it is in our case, the change in n has to be plus or minus one. Okay. We've derived it here starting in the ground state, and we've derived it thinking about ground two excited, so in absorption, but the exact opposite will be true. It doesn't matter if you change the place of these two functions and consider a mission, right? Doesn't matter if this is zero and one, all the math stays the same. It's still only going to be plus or minus one. 
And it actually doesn't matter if you start in the ground state. It was simpler for us to do here, right? But if you're starting in the first excited state, okay, and going to two, it's going to be the same. You can only go one to two. You can't go one to three, okay? You can't go one to four. You can't go one to five. It's only plus or minus one that will be allowed. And so although we only walked through it for the ground state, that's going to be generally true. A selection rule for vibrational spectroscopy here is the change in the vibrational quantum state is only plus or minus one. And all selection rules for rotational and vibrational spectroscopy are derived in this manner. You just use the appropriate wave function. Here, it was the harmonic oscillator ones with Eremite polynomials. But if you wanted to do rotational transitions, you would use the rigid rotor wave functions. Okay. Now, all of this is built on harmonic oscillator. So this is strictly only things that obey harmonic oscillator, right? For low temperatures. Okay. It turns out that transitions do violate this. They're much rarer, but transitions do violate this because we actually have Morse potentials, not harmonic oscillators. And so the transitions that do violate this, we term them overtones. Okay, so the strongest and the most prevalent ones are when you're changing the vibrational state on some step ladder from zero to one or one to two. You can change from zero to two, but it's usually much, much weaker. It's not allowed from the selection rules. It's forbidden, but it does happen and we call that an overtone. So you will still see them in vibrational spectroscopy. Okay, so that's the quantum mechanics of the selection rules for vibrational spectroscopy and the difference between permanent and dynamic dipoles. Next time we'll look at actual vibrational spectroscopy and think about the peak shapes and how many peaks there should be for different vibrations and different amplitudes of motion. That's all coming up in the next video. See you then.